Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to our Nancy Drew Games review series, where we are ranking every single Nancy Drew game on six key aspects, being the story and premise of each game, the suspects, the puzzles, the music, the atmosphere, and the ending of each game. I'm your host, Jameson. And I'm Julian. What's going on, everyone? And today we are reviewing Nancy Drew 23, Shadow at the Water's Edge. Easily the scariest Nancy Drew game of all time. And... Ashamingly, I think that's what the community thinks of it. Sure, it is the scariest game, but people don't appreciate, or maybe they just don't even know, how deep and sad and just overall compelling this story is. It's got an amazing story that's just super sad. It hones in on this one family in Japan named the Shizumis. The Shizumi family follows three generations of Shizumis being, well, technically only two, seeing as one of the generations has passed away. And that would be the grandmother, Takai, and then the three young grandchildren, Rentaro, Yumi, and Miwako. Now, Rentaro isn't actually related to the Shizumis, but he is kind of like a orphaned boy who grew up next door of some sort. And he's dating Miwako, who is the youngest daughter of the Shizumis. And the mother has died of really tragic circumstances, and we'll get into that later. To my knowledge, there's no mention of the father, which I think is kind of interesting. Yeah, I, come to think of it, you're right. But uh, what this game does really well is that it perfectly depicts Japanese culture, in my opinion, and especially the, the traditions and how valuable Japanese families and their culture as a whole value traditions. It's a big component in this game, following traditions and just hearing everyone's dialogue going on about family life and all of that. But another different route that this game takes is uh, obviously what everyone knows it for, how scary it is. So the story and premise is pretty interesting in that it ties back the previous game trail, the Twister. As a reward for Nancy solving the mystery with the Canute Storm team, uh, forgetting his last, his first name, Krollmeister. It's just PG Krollmeister. PG Krollmeister. There you go. He's booked Nancy a stay at the Ryokan Hie in Japan, and this is supposed to be a nice getaway, but. Obviously, Nancy can't have nice things. She's a detective. Things start to go wrong literally as she's walking through the front door and a portrait of the dead mother of the Shizumi family falls off the wall and it's just a bunch of bad mojo. There's a lot of disturbing looks being thrown and you just get the idea that this was not a good thing in retrospect to Nancy entering the Ryukan. I don't know. But it's really just a confusing sequence because the two ladies that are present at the counter, Takai and Miwako, Takai is the eldest of the generation, she's probably in her 70s, she turns to Miwako as soon as the portrait falls off the wall and goes, do you believe me now? And Miwako says, Obasa not only fell, and Takai just goes on to scold her granddaughter and then heads back to her cultural room through the garden. Then Miwako welcomes Nancy and gives her a room key and you get to chat with her about her robotic cat, but we'll get more into those characters in the next category. It should be noted that Bess and George are also on this vacation, and they spend all their time at the expo downtown checking out some sort of convention. They never really go much into what it is about, but Nancy needs their help for multiple things going on through the game, ranging from getting books about ghost hunting to all sorts of other stuff like robotic cat orders and commands. But overall, the trouble arises where Nancy begins to see some spooky things. And I th I don't want to give too much away in the story and premise, because that, that all the spooks might deserve a seventh special category, in my opinion. Yeah, that's fair. And we have to edit in spooks for this. Yeah, I, I do think that spooks where spooks are due. We'll probably spend a good five to ten minutes in the atmosphere category just covering all the amazing hauntings in this game. We'll probably do the same for Ghost of Thornton Hall also. One thing that I want to say right now on the category of hauntings is there are a lot of very iconic hauntings in this game. And there is one that is so slept on that I didn't even know existed. And I'll bet that many of you have forgotten that it was a sequence too, as it might even be an optional event, but I'm not sure. Either way, this part of the game, I think, is hands down the scariest moment in any Nancy Drew franchise. It's chilling, and I want to know, you go ahead and take your guesses right now until we get to atmosphere, because I want to know how many of you actually guessed what it is. Leaving you guys on a bit of a cliffhanger there, we're going to move on to suspects now, and... It, I'm just thinking about it now. How old would you say that Miwako and Rentaro are? Miwako and Rentaro are probably like, if I had to guess, 17 or 18. They're, I, they're pretty young. That just occurred to me. I don't know Miwa why I always thought them were older. Y you know what? I'll, I'll, bet, I'll bet they're around Nancy's age, a little older. So I'd say early 20s at most. Well, the thing is, the tradition at the Ryokan is that it is passed down to the eldest daughter in the family. Unfortunately, the eldest daughter in this generation, Yumi Shizumi, 
my god, that rhymes. I never realized that. <laughs> <laughs> Yumi Shizumi wants nothing to do with the Ryokan life. The, moment, the second she could, she bought herself an apartment in the big city and she moved out. And now she works at a bento stand at the expo center. And we'll get into Yumi's debatably fun bento puzzles later. I think we'll start our analysis on Miwako. She's probably the central most suspect of the game. And I could probably call her maybe my least favorite suspect, to be honest. She's very short with Nancy at a lot of the times of the game, and that's understandable. Mm -hmm. She comes off a little unlikable, but when we learn more and more about her backstory, it's, like, totally understandable. Yeah, Miwako is just under a great deal of stress. Personally, she really enjoys the Ryokan life and managing things, but she's just in a state of constant dread because she knows that as soon as Yumi comes to her senses or Takai forces her to, she's going to have to surrender the business over to her older sister, who doesn't care for it. Miwako's grandmother, Takai, is the one pulling all the strings here in the family, at least. She's, as Jamie, I would actually say she's older than 70. She comes like... She comes off as like 80 or 90, honestly. I'm I don't know, sure. maybe she ages weird. But she's in charge of teaching cultural lessons to all the guests that stay at the Ryokan. And this is a pretty unique part of the game that I appreciated. Yeah, from 7 to 10.30, or maybe it's 7.30 to 10, you can find Takai in the cultural room on the first floor, where she'll give you lessons about Japanese tea ceremonies, and how to write in katakana, and origami, and all sorts of traditional things like that. The moment we first had a conversation with her, she was holding some bombshell of a secret. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know why, but that's you just kind of get that from her while playing through the game and talking to her more. She's very dismissive, similar, similarly to Miwako. She doesn't really like that Nancy always pries. And she's extremely touchy on the topic of her dead daughter, Kasumi. Gosh, stop calling her her dead daughter. Let's say late mother or something. I, I feel bad for just like so... Y you start That's to, what it is. I mean, but you get sympathy for these people after you play this game a time or two. They're, uh -huh. they're yeah. tortured. Just Anyhow, stating facts, bro. the number one vibe that you get off from these people when you start up the game is that they're not telling you something. There's something that's getting held back. Mm -hmm. And um, honestly, the most forthright suspect who's just up front with Nancy about everything, and this does start to make sense because, spoiler alert, this suspect is the culprit of the game. That would be probably my favorite suspect, Rentaro. Yeah, Rentaro is great. He's he just adds a lot to the game. He's a quirky, funny little. What's his job title? He he's is like a handyman. He's for the he's the family. handyman, the gardener, all sorts of things, and he has a knack for mechanics and all sorts of electrical engineering and stuff like that. He's Miwako's boyfriend, and with that comes a couple of interesting conversations. It's pretty much. A known fact that the two of them don't get along too well. Rentaro says, I think, you ever watch like the sad dramatic rom-com movies where the couple is fighting for the entire movie and then at the end they're happy for like five minutes? Those videotapes are like my entire life with Miwako, except at the end of every week somebody rewinds the tape. <laughs> that's a good quote. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's got the most personality in the game, that's for sure. He loves the, um, he loves the big city, and one thing that I think is an interesting subplot that they never much touch on is that he and Yumi always had much more in common than he and Miwako did. And maybe it was just the age gap between the two, because Yumi's maybe like six years older than him that kind of stopped them from getting together like how he did with Miwako. But it should be noted that Rentaro has been a part of the Shizumi family, and he's been their neighbors and pretty much attended all family gatherings since, since they were like eight or nine or something. Mm -hmm. And he was always just like playing board games of the family and stuff like that and some of Kasumi's heartbreaking letters read that you find around the game. Okay, one of my favorite lines from Rintaro is a cool conversation you have with him about ghosts. And we ask his opinion on what's going on with the Ryokan. Because if we haven't made it clear yet, guests have been getting frightened away from the Ryokan Scooby-Doo style, saying that all sorts of weird noises and figures come jumping out of the shadows at night. Yeah, we should have mentioned business is not booming right now. But anyways, we ask Rintaro what his opinion is on all of the hauntings, and he very confidently states that ghosts aren't real. Ghosts only happen when people have a guilty conscience and an imagination. Yeah, his reasoning for that is that why do what do ghosts always want? Revenge. If ghosts were real, then they would want all sorts of things besides revenge. But the only other thing that they seem to want is vengeance or revenge for some unforgivable misdeed. And one other part to his character that's 
uh, very important when it comes to the end game is he does not want Miwaka to have anything to do with the Ryokan. Yeah, he wants to kind of help her break the chains of the Ryokan and her family traditional chives and try to get out to the big city, which we should mention Takai absolutely detests. Mm -hmm. She is borderline disowned Yumi for moving out at such a young age. That's and definitely where you see that cultural difference in older generations, Japanese and younger, is that uh, Takai is extremely old school. She wants traditions to rule the world, her world at least, and others not so much. So you get that little bit of conflict between them. So one thing I just want to say that's a personal tie to this game that's cool is that Julian and I have never left the country, to my knowledge. Did you ever go to Canada? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, Canada doesn't count. No, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, this is an exclusively Japanese cultural issue, I think. Maybe there are some other cultures where there's a huge divide between the elderly and their traditional culture and the youth and their new modern culture, but it was really fascinating to see how it works, because it's like two different worlds in one game. So I think then we should talk about Yumi, the eccentric one. Uh, she's the one who moved out at 18, got an apartment in the city. Lord knows how she's making her wages besides just working in that concession Bento. stand. Bento, man. Bento's booming. Bento's like working at a lemonade stand for a living. I don't know. Maybe she just charges the super high prices. Could. I don't know. Uh, Yumi's a fun suspect to talk to, and she's also friends with Bess and George, though of course we can never see that interaction play out on screen, we just hear it over phone call. And all the pictures that we receive of the two, which definitely aren't photoshopped. <laughs> Yumi's interesting. She is the oldest daughter, so rightfully the Ryokan is hers, but she is super passionate about rejecting that claim. She has nothing to do with the Ryokan. She's, she's a real rebellious type, for one thing. Yeah, her whole thing is that the Ryokan never really spoke to her personally, and she was always more drawn to the city, and so she decided to heck with tradition, I'm gonna go make myself happy. And that made her grandmother very unhappy. Yeah, uh, she's definitely a I-do-whatever-I-want type of character. Uh, she runs a bento stand, and bento is uh, pretty much serves the purpose of puzzles in this game. Yeah, bento is an optional puzzle for the most part, because you can play it time and time again to get more phone charms from Yumi. But the first time you meet her, you have to solve a bento puzzle, and then later on in the game, you have to solve another one. And it's a pretty easy logic puzzle. It's pretty pivotal, requires a lot of guessing. I remember it's brutal on Senior Detective. Yeah, is it, is it 4x4 on Senior Detective? No, it's just extremely, like, just vague instructions. Oh man, that must be horrible. Anyhow, um, Yumi is very colorful, she's very friendly, she has a homemade dress that makes her look like a cupcake with a bunch of icing on it. And she just, looks like an anime girl. She, she looks like the most expensive <laughs> cupcake you'd see at a bakery. She's just got like <laughs> ribbons and this flowery dress, it's crazy. Well that dress perfectly depicts her personality though. Yeah, and just that she made it herself speaks mountains about her. She's Japanese fashion is like very, very eccentric, and mm -hmm. I think that they kind of tried to capture that in this game. Otherwise, uh, she is, like I said, very friendly. She gives you the key to her apartment so that you can go retrieve more bento boxes from her. And exploring her apartment is a very interesting part of the game as well. Otherwise, uh, I say she honestly actually ties for Rentoro with friendliest suspect, even though I personally like Rentoro more because he's always getting excited about numbers and giving you puzzles to do. Speaking of puzzles. Sp puzzles time, yeah. Okay, I think... I hate nonograms. Yeah. This puzzle category has to begin with nonograms, so... Nonograms is the one black mark on this game for me, and I seriously can't even hold it against it. I am just mentally inept to understand nonograms. <laughs> okay, I kind of understand them. That, that doesn't stop them from being impossible. Just looking at you, endgame nonogram puzzle. Oh my god, the endgame nonogram puzzle is horrible. So, but uh... <laughs> The bulk of the puzzles are actually issued by Rentero, and it comes in the form of a little puzzle book featuring nonograms, Sudoku, and Renograms. But it's nice foreshadowing that all these Japanese number game type of things, they come back and have a lot of prevalence later in main storyline puzzles. And I guess that was a good way to kind of intertwine Japanese culture with the puzzles in this game. There's also yeah. a couple that, like we mentioned earlier, origami is a big thing in this game. Origami is a big part of the game, yeah. Uh, one thing that I want to say is that Sudoku and Renograms were actually a lot of fun to do. I don't know if we, how often we say this, but we always play these games HDMI'd onto a TV in our living room, and then we use a Bluetooth mouse to play from the couch, and we have our dad play with us. We're really excited to have him play this one with us because it's got a lot of fun stuff in it. And uh, 
There's there's nothing more fun than three people pointing at a flat screen TV, shouting, trying to figure out what goes where in a Sudoku puzzle. Six Sudoku puzzles, one after another. <laughs> so that that was an interesting experience, to say the least. Uh, a couple puzzles have to do with phone con with phone context too, and there's two big ones that we haven't mentioned yet. That's Logan, the assistant to Savannah Woodham. And, uh, well, Savannah Woodham herself. Savannah Woodham herself, yeah. Now, I love that they brought back Savannah Woodham and Ghost of Thornton Hall, which is the second in line, I'd say, for scariest Nancy Drew, because it really gives the effect that Savannah is, like, an omen that always precedes the spooky Nancy Drews. Mm-hmm. And she is a ghost hunter from Georgia. Probably Savannah, Georgia, come to think of it, but... <laughs> she's certainly got the accents, but, uh... Her, her assistant... Logan is one of my favorite phone contacts well, ever. He's supposed to come off as annoying, but he's just more funny. Yeah, he's a funny guy. The first time you call him, uh, Nance, because, like, Savannah is, uh, no longer a ghost chaser. She used to be a ghost chaser of sorts, and she's retired from that line of work. What does she do now? Do you remember? I think she's just an author. She's just some sort of author. Uh, I forget what it is that she specializes in. But Nancy calls Logan at the beginning of the game and says, Hey, I was hoping you could help me get my hands on some information about the Shizumi family, which Savannah wrote in one of her books, and goes, Oh, great! You mean you can help me with that? No, I haven't gotten to hang up on somebody in so long, I've forgotten what it feels like. I wonder if I'm still good at it. And then he hangs up on you. And the best part is, if you call him right back right after that, which you don't always do, you can go, Excuse me, did you just hang up on me? I did! Between you and me, it was great. In fact, and then he hangs up again. <laughs> Yeah, he's a, he's a fun phone contact. He actually does uh, become valuable later on in the game because he has a crush on Bess, and we need to manipulate him by having Bess flirt with him so we can get Savannah's book because somebody ripped out a chapter on the Ryukan Hiei. It is a long string of events, but it ends up being a pretty funny phone contact, and you get some good conversations out of it. Yeah, it's, it's a fun time. But that's also the offspring of the major Sudoku puzzle, which no, is... No, that's the getting the cat stuff. He just he talking to Logan is just by getting the book. The guy who has the commands for the cat puzzle, for the to give the commands to the cat. Oh yeah. Yeah. He says that he only shares his information with the intellect, so you have to solve the Sudoku puzzle. Okay, you want to talk about the cat? The 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 fifth suspect we forgot to cover. Okay, yeah. So technically, there is a fifth suspect which we forgot to cover. And by that, I just mean that, that he has a dialogue box, and that would be Suki or. Maybe it's a she. I don't care. It's, it's a, a robot. It's probably a she. It's a robot, so it doesn't really matter. So, Suki is Miwako's robot cat, who would, like, be really creepy. Dad certainly thought it was super creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Suki just electronically prayers and chills and hangs out with Miwako all the time. And whenever Miwako goes to bed for the night, Suki stays at the desk and guards it. And so, if you try to, like, mess around with Yumi's things, Suki will actually, like, go full-on attack mode and pounce you and start clawing you up, and then Nancy gets kicked out of the Ryokan. The game comes to a screeching halt unless you find the code, the code word to bypass Suki's security. It's Mate. Yeah, it is, it's, a, that's the offspring of the mega-large Sudoku puzzle. Okay, this is, I'm gonna make sure that we can have just, like, at least a frame of this horrific puzzle right here in the video. Gosh, it is just... It's not that it's necessarily hard, but it's long, and it's tedious. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's... It's... If you can imagine it right here... No, I'm just gonna put up a picture and describe it. It is five Sudoku puzzles with corner squares of each one overlapping in the middle. So if you mess up one of them, then you're starting the next one inherently with an error. Yeah, I mean, a great deal of satisfaction comes when you finally complete it. But my my big thing is it would have been a lot nicer if after each little box you finish one-fifth of the puzzle. And Nancy says, that looks right. That yeah, she have waits helped a ton. She waits until she solves the whole thing. To be fair, it's kind of obvious if you're doing something wrong in Sudoku if you know how to do Sudoku. No, we... I mean, just... A couple staring at it long enough, we get lazy, and we were haste even... makes waste. Yes, haste makes waste. <laughs> <laughs> so just take your time. We edited out at least an hour of Sudoku footage from our long play. <laughs> we seriously did. What is your favorite puzzle in the game? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if I necessarily call it my favorite, but I think that one of the most clever puzzles in the game is definitely the uh, 
rearranging the wires on the back of the portrait that broke at the beginning. I knew you would say that. Uh, you go ahead and talk about that, because I know you like that one. But yeah, I'll I, think about my favorite puzzle. I like to solve it all the time. It's probably my favorite one. It's, yeah, as Jamie said, the portrait of Kasumi that falls off the wall, it shatters. This happens at the earliest 5%, 10% of the game. You have to talk to Rensuro. Rensuro gives you permission to fiddle around with it, see if you can work the framing on the back. And what you need to do is rearrange every single one of these, like, line... Every single one of these, like... What are they? Wires. They're like some yeah. sort of wires. There's no explanation for what <laughs> function they serve. Yeah, there's just a ton of wires behind the frame. And you need to rearrange them so that absolutely no wires cross or intersect. The first look you take at this puzzle, you just want to claw your eyes out. It, it seems impossible, but after enough rearranging and just fiddling around with it, a lot of guess and check, uh, it's, it's possible after a couple minutes. And it's just like, it's another super satisfying thing to, to solve, I would say. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and just be upfront and honest. I'm not the biggest fan of puzzles in this game. I'd say that my two favorite puzzles is the one Julian just said, and the Renegrams, which you have to do for Rentero. But it just seems like such a wasted opportunity. What about the matching color thing to escape uh, over the balcony? That's a clever puzzle. It's just making symmetry, but you know, never the timed puzzle is never really my favorite. They're not so much fun because they're usually stressful, but it's clever. Um. I'd say that there really are just two puzzles in this game that uh, I'm fond of. What about Yumi's symbols she sends us? Okay, actually, that is a very, very clever sequence. It's an untraditional puzzle, but I guess I'll go ahead and talk about that here, because yeah. that's a great sequence in the game. So, throughout the game, Yumi keeps on sending you all these really weird anime pictures on her phone that are just goofy. <laughs> It'll just be really weird pictures of her, Bess, and George, or all three of them with just emojis all over them and stuff like that, and like anime eyes and stuff like that. But um, once Nancy gets like seven or eight of these photos, she starts to think that there's probably like a reason that Yumi keeps on sending these like eight times in a row. Like if I sent eight memes to my friend, one after another, without any response from them, I, I would probably just get, throw in the towel and say, okay, they're not going to laugh. <laughs> but, so Nancy goes down to the killer station, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, where there's like a pachinko parlor and a photo booth and she prints them all out, and she realizes that there are Japanese katakana symbols on it that are all overlapping from photo to photo. She has to figure out how to arrange them so that she can see them. And once she does, it becomes very clear that they are a code of some sort that Yumi has been sending Nancy. And that to me, in and of itself, is almost chilling. Because Yumi is obviously trying to tell Nancy something that she doesn't want Nancy to know that she wants her to know. It's like she's desperate to get Nancy to figure something out, but she's too shy or afraid to just say it outright. Mm -hmm. So that was like a really sinister moment of suspicion where you didn't know what exactly was going on. And the code that she keeps sending Nancy selfie by selfie pretty much. It unlocks this little box in her room, and I also love Yumi's room. We'll cover a little bit in the atmosphere and especially the haunting that takes place there. In the box that we have to unlock, there's a letter from Kasumi, right? Um, it's to, it's, it's to her pen pal, Marianne. Yeah, I believe so. It's actually important and we should have talked about. We'll talk about her again here, might as well. But also in there is a series of numbers that seem like they would be part of a monster nonogram puzzle. And I'm not even going to try to explain nonograms. I don't think it's the best designed puzzle. I would have much preferred if they found a way to make a renogram puzzle work as the final thing. Can you imagine like a 250 number renogram? I would love that. That would be so much fun <laughs> if even mathematically possible but at the same time there's an important plot point where like these letters were left behind by Kasumi for Yumi and Miwako to find so you'd have to like make it so there were two different components of the Renegrams puzzle that both of them would have but I don't know how you could do that so this is something that we may have touched on briefly before and that's Kasumi's letters to her pen pal and those are super super clever where the way that it works is when Kasumi was growing up she had a pen pal in Alberta Canada I believe and there's almost, like, some reference that it might have a tie-in to White Wolf of Icicle Creek, just because it was so close in the area, and that her pen pal might have been somebody that she knew there. I'd have to take another close look at the letters and see if there are any more references. But it's pretty interesting because her name's Marianne, and Takai was very against this ever since Kasumi was young, just writing to some foreigner often 
And I think it always stemmed from Takai's distaste for just the modern life. She likes to keep things traditional, old school. So she hated to see her daughter write these messages and just become infatuated with this girl she's never met in kind of like a, a more modern civilization. And she feared that someday her daughter Kasumi would just leave the Ryokan altogether to join this new friend of hers. In a way, Takai is kind of xenophobic when it comes to that. She's kind of afraid of change and she's always embraced tradition and she'd like her family to embrace the same tradition for generations to come. So in that regard, Takai, throughout the game, you find a lot of letters to Marianne from Kasumi. And sometimes you don't even realize that Kasumi is the mother and it just adds this building suspicion that's really, really weird. It's revealed so well, it or at is, least it's so shocking. It is pretty shocking. This is, it's an amazing plot twist, I guess. And uh, the way that you find all this stuff is just bizarre. I'm trying to think of what else to say. I got distracted in my head. Um, yeah, they're always such benign and heartfelt letters too. It'll be like, Dear Marianne, today I was able to have, there was a giant storm and we were able to have everybody come inside at the same time and Yumi came down from her room and so did Miwako and they didn't even fight. And we all sat down and played a board game and Takai had a lot of fun with us too. And it's just, you can tell that Kasumi really loved her family and she loved it more than anything else when her siblings and Rentoro and everyone were able to just put aside their differences and be wholesome together. We ought to just wrap up the puzzles category then because more often than not, you will find letters from Marianne to, from Kasumi to Marianne as rewards for solving puzzles throughout the game. You find it in Miwako's puzzle box, you find it in Yumi's locked box, and you find it some other places too. And they have just a very big reveal later on. And so, otherwise for puzzles, my final note on this is I am not a big fan of the puzzles in this game. They are all exceptionally difficult. Yeah, people said, people do call this the hardest game, for sure. I think that a lot of people just say that because the Sudoku puzzle is such a pain. Because you can't really cheat on Sudoku because it's going to take you a long time just to fill in all those squares one by one. So in, I don't think it's the hardest by any means. I don't think it's the hardest game either, but I just am not the biggest fan of the puzzles. So in that regard, I think we should go ahead and move into music. The music of this game is perfectly spooky. There's that great Japanese feel in it, but then especially some of the tracks that play in the Ryukan, it makes you afraid to play the game at night, seriously. Like, walking through the halls, casual things become terrifying when this one particular track starts playing. That being Kasumi. The music in this game is cleverly in two different branches. There is the traditional Japanese instruments, and then there is the electronic kind of city life music which is very very different dad was outspoken about how he didn't like that as much yeah he'd never liked leaving the rio when we played this so i think we'll go ahead and just make sure that we're clear about what is different for each track so first you want to give about your favorite one yeah kasumi is my favorite track by far it is bone chilling like it it's kind of hard to describe but be, in terms of like what it actually is it's a bunch of japanese instrumentals but it's super slow it's a naturally slow song but then it e it gets even slower at the end every single rhythm every single beat slows down there's way less beats per minute it's like a pause a, a second pause in between everything and, and you get this, this yeah. dark like it's it sounds like an airplane streaming overhead like with super low bass and it's like slowed down it's just a slow motion kind of song and it really does add to the creepy mood everything. I believe that's the main trailer music that they play for the trailer mm -hmm. of this game, and it's just terrifying. And now that we know it's called Kasumi, that just puts things into perspective and makes it even scarier, honestly. Yeah, it should be noted that Kasumi technically is the cover art of this game, or at least the ghost of her. The yure of Kasumi. That's, that's one Japanese word I know how to pronounce from this <laughs> game. So we'll play a little snippet of Kasumi right here. It is spooky. Now, appropriately, I think that we should cover the alternate spooky music, which would be Haunting. That one is very different. I wouldn't call it my favorite track, but it is, I would call it spookier than Kasumi. It just, it ends very suddenly and very loudly. And there's no real rhythm to it or anything. It's just unsettling. It's electronic, I'd say, and it's, it's, I'd say that this is like the city version of the spooky music in this game. 
sometimes it'll play when Nancy goes to bed. And I think that there's little I can do to describe it, so I'll just play it right here. While we're still focused on the Ryokan, there's two more important tracks to cover, and that's Ryokan and Traditional. These kind of take a break from being scary. I wouldn't call them scary. They're more just like... Peaceful. They're, yeah, they're peaceful Japanese... It's just peaceful Japanese music. And it's very refreshing to hear one of these tracks after, I don't know, something like Kasumi. And I should also mention that this is traditional Japanese music, as some of the titles suggest. I'll get into the more modern Japanese music, as it is titled that in a second. But how about you play those two back to back? Both of these pieces are super beautiful, and it makes me think of the garden area, which we're about to touch on in Atmosphere. But the gardens, it's so tranquil, and so is this music. I just think the two go hand in hand so perfectly. So right now, I'm going to play Ryokan, followed by Traditional. And then on the other side of things, whenever Nancy goes out to the subway and goes riding out to the city to visit Yumi or go to her apartment or play pachinko, you'll hear these two tracks more often than not, the pop and modern tracks. They, I liked them much more when I was younger, and I still like them now, but not to the same degree. They're definitely a very big tone shift from the rest of the game, and I'm so glad that they saw it, took it upon themselves to make a complete different kind of music to represent the city life of the game. Because if they just played the regular music when you went out to visit Yumi, that would be so weird. And I honestly feel like it's a perfect fit. So I'll play back to back right here, modern and then pop. A big thing that goes well with the music is that Japan's just like, to some degree, a very technological advanced society. We yeah. see that with the bullet train system and, well, they have robotic cats. Yeah. I mean, that kind of says it all. I want a robotic cat. And this music, it's kind of, it's very techno. It's very, it goes very well with the technology Some of that incorporated world. Electronic dance music. Yeah, no, I think that's what they were going for, is like, they, sh they show off all of these crazy technologies that have been invented in Japan, and the music is kind of, that's what it was going for as well, just that similar feel. So. Otherwise, the music in this game is broken into a couple of categories. There's traditional and peaceful, modern and peaceful, traditional and scary, and modern and scary. Personally, I think modern and scary is the scariest of the scary. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you. Overall, scary tracks are my favorite, though. That's what they really hit the nail on the head with them. I think it's all pretty good given the circumstances and settings. Moving now, on to Atmosphere. This is going to be the beef of the review, because Atmosphere will be broken into two categories, because this review will have a special category, specifically for the spooks and scares that this game features. Okay, what do you want to break down first? Just... Let's just go with the settings first. Yeah, I think it's a no-brainer that our favorite location is the garden, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Well, the baths are pretty creepy, too. Okay. But, yeah, the garden, for what it's worth, it's a very common area, and it's beautiful. It's um, The Ryokan is almost like a castle, and the courtyard would be the garden, where it's just a rotund square of rooms that people get rented out to, and they have all these cool canvas sliding doors and traditional architecture, and then in the middle of it all is this garden with a koi pond and a cute little bridge and Rantaro's shack. There's crickets chirping and a stream flowing and uh, all sorts of bamboo shoots and traditional plants all over the place. You know, I remember when I was really little playing this game, whenever a trick like Kasumi would play, I'd just feel safer in the garden area. Yeah. I would try to just investigate things there whenever that track played. Because <laughs> make no mistake, there are things to be fearful of if you are playing this game and are also a child. <laughs> There's a lot of breaks in the settings. We see it just kind of with the traditional Ryokan and then the expansive, crazy Japanese world. But one of the ones that's different from both of them is Yumi's apartment. 
it's just, I really liked that we got to go there and see kind of just like a snippet of her life, how she decorates the place and everything. And it also takes place, one of my favorite hauntings we're about to cover. All in all, the game, the, the atmosphere did not limit it. It feels like a very big game. Maybe that's due to the bullet train. This game also nailed transportation on the head. I like this so much more than, uh, like the Phantom of Venice, because I like that it's a unique puzzle at first, having to pull up the map every single time you take the bullet train, but then once you get to your destination, it's like marked. You can just kind of teleport from location to location, and can you imagine if you just had to tra every travel every time? Over? Oh, oh my, that'd be like the senior detective This challenge. would be one of the worst games ever, but I'm so glad that they made that, they made everyone's life easier by kind of having instant access to a location after you access it, which is what I think other games ultimately lack. Yeah, so in that regard, I think we should all be noted that this game takes place exclusively at night. In the day, Nancy is actually a English exchange teacher who helps teach Japanese students and young children English, and she gets to grade their homework, which I think is an optional puzzle. And I never understood that because I thought she was here for vacation purposes. Nancy can never just vacation. She probably anticipated there being no mysteries, so then she decided to be an English teacher by volunteer, but now that there is a mystery, she's doing both. Anyhow, uh, Fumiko is a star student, and everything she does grammatically is perfect. <laughs> Takio, on the other hand. Yeah, Takeo is insane. <laughs> No. Okay, you, you like the garden. The scariest location in the game is definitely the baths, and you don't typically enter it until the, the, the back quarter of the game. I mean, both baths, because there are two. Oh my gosh. Uh, it's where we learn Kasumi died. Yeah. We gotta cover Kasumi's death. Yes, we do. We're, I think we'll cover some of that in ending. We'll, we'll cover the ending in everything that happens after the nonogram puzzle. But until then, I think that it's time to go ahead and enter the spook. So, spook number one. It's actually the first time you go to sleep at the Ryukan. Once you hit the set alarm button, Nancy says her little line of dialogue and goes off to bed. You wake up in the middle of the night to see a silhouette of the ghost girl on your balcony someone is on your balcony it looks like they're floating it looks like they have long wet hair mm -hmm. and they turn to face your window and then they float away it's just a shadow yeah that set the tone for a great spooky game and for some reason nancy just puts on the detective cap goes out there to investigate and there's nothing and she rips the screen in the process uh, yeah, that was interesting how it just instantly disappeared. Was Rintero, like, looming over her balcony, playing with a puppet of it or something? I have no clue Actually, how that worked. Actually, I, I think he was, now that I think about it. I guess that's the most logical, the logical explanation. But... Okay, so, in that regard, the next in Iconic Scare, as Julian said, is probably the mirror scare in the bathroom. You want to talk about what happens when you... F you know what? This is one of those scares where we're going to go ahead and just pull out the clip. Yeah, get ready to... Drop all the popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are gonna be scared. Here's the clip. Imagine popping popcorn for these reviews. So what is so uh, jarring about that clip is that as soon as you enter the bath, this is your first time entering this location, Nancy, the game instantly takes over with an intro cinematic. I didn't like that. I remember the first time I did it, I was like, I don't like what's happening. I don't like this. I don't like this. <laughs> I like to be in control. Yeah, so that was instantly something that was just nerve-wracking. And partially, I think the scariest part of it is the realization when Nancy looks in the mirror that there is a woman behind her. Not, and then Nancy turns behind her, there's no one there, and then when she looks back, the woman's looking up. But just the three seconds the game gives you to realize that someone is in the room with you is chilling. Mm hmm And then after a couple seconds, it gets closer and closer. You don't actually see it moving. It just kind of like teleports a foot ahead of where it used to be. And then it slashes the mirror, the mirror shatters, and... Well, that's the end of that haunting. Savannah, the ghost hunter phone contact, later brilliantly explains why she thinks that was faith. And she asks you when Nancy says, if Nancy tells Savannah, I saw something weird in the mirror. 
and Savannah goes immediately, did the mirror break? And when Nancy tells her yes, then Savannah's like, there's no doubt in my mind that was fake. Because you know what the difference between a real haunting and an illusion is, Nancy? And that's time. If an illusion is happening, then it can only happen for so long before it gives up its secret. So if that was an illusion, then somebody broke that mirror before you could examine it long enough to figure it out. That was a super good explanation. Yeah, I, I was honestly like convinced and sold at that point that, okay, it's not actually a ghost. And I'd say 95% of players don't put two and two together to realize there's that whole ordeal with the mirror and then the first time you meet Rintero, the culprit, he's coming out of the bathroom with the toolbox. I don't know, that you just kind of had to be keen to pick up on it. But then, in regards to other hauntings, uh, there's a couple of minor ones, like doors shutting and slamming, a bunch of stuff like that. A there couple of guests leave because hauntings happen to them that we don't get to see. There is a paper that you can find in a laundry basket in the bathroom, which I don't know if it's optional or not, but it tells you all sorts of cool Japanese superstitions and stuff. Some of them are weird, like... Uh, if you do this, you'll turn into a cow. I don't know if they just made that up. <laughs> but no, uh, I don't think they did make any of those up. Those are real, I think. Yeah, it's like whistling at night attracts the, uh, snakes. The color red is unlucky, and do not write your name in red, or anyone's name, because then they will be followed with danger and bad fortune. And also that the number four is really unlucky in traditional Japanese culture, and that is why most hotels and hospitals don't have a fourth floor or a room that's numbered four. And so, mm -hmm. that comes back later on in the game. Where, Super good foreshadowing. Yeah, where Nancy's katakana that she does at her first cultural visit with Takai later gets replaced with an identical copy, but it's in red ink. And Nancy, when she enters the room, just goes, that wasn't red before. And mm -hmm. it's it's such a chilling moment. And then otherwise, some Nancy stays in room 24, and at one point in the game, someone just absconds with the two, and it's just room four. Yeah, there's just little things like that that aren't direct, like gotcha jump scares but it makes you very nervous to keep playing the game now i don't know how many of you have guessed it yet but this is my favorite haunting in the game and i think it's so incredibly underrated it's, it, it's a brilliant so unique. it's a brilliant sequence of events so i think we'll go ahead and start covering how it begins and then from here really we'll just start covering this point to the end of the game after Yumi goes on a chore run, she makes you her bento, she comes back and she realizes she lost track of the time, it's way too late and that all the subways have closed. This starts the true end game where you have to stay the night at Yumi's apartment. And it, it's honestly Jamie and I's favorite part of the game. Once Nancy gets there, she's able to put in the code that she found, that she figured out from the pictures Yumi sent, and open up the frog container and see what's in it. Inside are part of the nonogram numbers, so she can now try to solve the nonogram puzzle down in the baths. And then also another letter from Marianne to Yumi, if I'm not mistaken. Or maybe there's not one in there. And so anyhow, Nancy goes ahead and sets her alarm and goes to sleep. And then this brilliant haunting begins to play. Was that? All these weird letters start to play and show on the screen in neon that spell out clips of all the different letters to Marianne that we found from Kasumi. And they're all just kind of incoherent and letters begin to fade until it finally leaves you with the grim message, I know your secret, Yumi. I can't wait to see you again. Did we ever get a follow-up with that? Yes, we did. Yumi was one of the people who felt very, very guilty about her mother's death, and we'll get to that. And honestly, I think that that was kind of just like Rentaro talking there about how 
Ghosts are what happen when guilty people let their imaginations run free. I don't know why Nancy saw the apparition, but that was Yumi's way of saying that she feels guilty and horrible for what happened to her mother and that she was responsible to a degree. And she wanted Nancy to help her get some closure. And so she, that's why she started sending her all the things. The entire game, we pass around a note that we need translated regarding Kasumi's death. We never actually knew what happened to her, all we know is that she died, but it ended up being a tragic accident that almost everyone was indirectly responsible for. First, First let's just say what the newspaper said, and then we'll talk about in a minute what Takai confesses. I should have mentioned that you get the newspaper clipping after you solve the uh, portrait backing in the in the very beginning of the game, but asking every single suspect to translate it, which is a it's a conversation option, just results in them handing it back, if not ending the game directly. <laughs> the newspaper clipping claims that Kasumi, who was I think 34 or something, she was a young mother, but and uh, what happened with her was that she was in the baths apparently and drowned somehow and it's speculated that maybe she slipped she fell there's no real indication of foul play but it was a tragic event and it listed in the paper that yumi found her and that must have been very hard for her and so i love the explanation for the story that happened first let's cover maybe the most ambitious haunting so once you finish the nonogram puzzles and i think this is officially where we're entering the ending category it's not a haunting dude we're yeah it, you, we, we it's were a telling, scare we were telling the story and you just interrupted it what story kasumi's death no what happens is you open the puzzle you get the katana you get tackled by the ghost and then you go talk to to, to uh takai and she comes clean about everything so the last spooky puzzle in the game is using the nonogram puzzle, the nonogram numbers to open up the safe that is in the baths where Kasumi died, which has since then been closed. The baths in there are just this horrible, murky, muddy color that's so creepy. And as soon as to Nancy opens it up, which takes forever, I hate this puzzle. This could opens be opens what up? Opens the safe on the wall. This could be my least favorite puzzle in the entire franchise. It's the safe that's above the shrine to Kasumi. And you have to open it with this giant nonograms puzzle, like 25 by 25 nonograms. She finds Kasumi's will. And Kasumi says basically that I think she wanted to have the Ryokan passed down to... No, she says that she doesn't want the Ryokan passed down if her daughters don't want her to have it passed down to them. She wants her daughters to have all the freedom of the world and not be restricted to the Ryokan. This goes exactly against everything Takai wanted, which, after reading this, it really frames Takai to look like the primary culprit here. And we confront her about it because she has to have some knowledge about this hidden away will, right? Well, she did, and she says she feels extremely guilty because she's been cloaking the granddaughters behind this idea that they have to stay here and they can't escape the Ryokan, when in actuality, their dead mom is the one that wanted them to be free from the world. But let's talk about real quick what really happened the night that Kasumi died, because it's a really tragic and just unexpected circumstance. So Marianne, Kasumi's pen pal, had finally come to visit Kasumi, and she was downtown. And This was a great way to tie back Marianne to the main plot. Yes, and Takai, as always, did not approve of Kasumi being indoctrinated by city life and embracing modern technology and civilization and well, so no, that's not it she was worried that she was just going to leave the ryokan as a whole because yeah she, she it, was afraid that kasumi would find something that she liked more than the ryokan out in the city and then leave her family so takai decided to fake sick and ask kasumi to stay home and care for her and do her jobs that night to really sell the whole fake sickness and so kasumi cleaned the baths which was normally takai's job and only takai knew how to do it properly Kasumi slipped or she fell and hit her head and drowned in the baths and was later found by Yumi. So, God, is that just a tragic story? And I can't imagine the guilt Takai felt after that, knowing that she was, I mean, this is borderline, like, pushing the whole accident type thing. I mean, yeah. it, it was an accident, but 
It was Nobody knew. Kasumi and Mi Yumi and Miwako always talk about how sad they were that she died, and they say that it was our fault because we were all here and nobody knew what was happening. But none of them knew that, Ka that Takai wasn't actually sick. Essentially, it boils down to if Takai wasn't petty and being annoying about her daughter giving a little freedom, then she would still be alive today. And I, so I hope she's happy living with that consequence of trying to keep the old tradition away because it cost her daughter's life pretty much. And Takai talk, telling you about that is the last conversation that you can have in the game before the culprit reveal. And you know what? It's maybe one of my favorite conversations with a suspect ever. Yeah, honestly. It's just, it's so good. Oh, and real quick, we might as well go ahead and show that final famous last haunting. This is what happens as soon as you open up the safe with Kasumi's will. find a way to cut these cords in half and fast so that happens at the end game and julian and i never knew about it for the first time we were playing it and <laughs> god it really blows the mirror sequence out of the water dad was shocked his heart exploded <laughs> it was a uh, a really tricky puzzle it was super intense and he thought it was even horrible when we messed up the first time and nancy ended up drowning but it was just a really unexpected hundred events and a direct attempt at the culprit to murder nancy so let's go ahead and cover the culprit reveal then, after we talk to Takai. The way that you stop Rentaro in this game is with his own undoing. He lets you borrow all sorts of little gadgets and stuff that he is proud to have created. He has an EVP recording thing that he is modifying, which is usually used for hunting ghost sounds and stuff, and you go to all sorts of different locations in the game to figure out everything that is being said and eavesdrop on people. But he has a modified version where if you press a button on it, it goes to every inbox and voicemail surrounding the Ryokan. Well, I really liked his motivation to get the the fake scares out here. It was because he, as he mentioned before, really wants Miwako to just leave this place in the past. And he wants to escape with her to just the modern life, living, a, living in a city or something. He talks a couple times about how much he loves New York and looks up to it and everything. But we never really thought that his intentions would go this far as to actually try to scare his girlfriend out of the family-owned Ryokan. It this almost, was a really dark twist, but it's not one that wasn't foreshadowed. It almost makes you wonder if he knows that Kasumi died because Takai was ignorant, and it maybe makes him spiteful or determined to make sure that something horrible like that doesn't happen to Miwako by being on the tight leash of her grandmother. So, after all of the hauntings, we finally find a note from him saying that he's got to repair something in, was it, like, room 34? Something like that, yeah. We go there, and he's setting up another haunting. And this time, we're actually able to catch him in the act, but he's going to claim that we were here sent by Savannah Woodham to do more research for Savannah's book on the Ryokan, which would instantly just expel Nancy from the Ryokan. She would be the most hated person in no one would understand us or take anything Nancy said at face value. But Nancy has the, the brains to record Ryokan. <laughs> Nancy has the brains to record uh, everything that using the EVP recorder, Nancy records Rentaro's entire maniacal villain monologue. Yeah, that was, it, it's not cheesy. It's like believable and it was pretty cool. And I loved that Rentaro still had that last ball to fire like, hey, I've got this thing that's gonna shut you down, but luckily we just had the perfect counter. Yeah, just blackmailing him. <laughs> and so, one last thing that's really unique about this endgame sequence is that Nancy has the choice to be lenient on Renshiro and say you'd better just apologize to Miwako and come clean with Takai and everybody, or she can say, nope, you tried to kill me in those baths and I am not forgiving you, in which case he just leaves the Shizumi family in disgrace and pretty much never returns. Yeah, it's super cool. It's something I wish her interactive did more is we get two separate endgame letters depending on that one choice. Super cool. So, uh, let's see, the endgame letter, Takai begins to come to set her senses and decides that she can't restrain her daughters and she needs to let them be themselves. She follows the wishes left in Kasumi's will and lets Miwako take over the Ryokan and Yumi pursue her best life in the city. Uh, the daughters actually set aside all of their differences though and Yumi's able to set up Bento for the Ryokan. They have like a little restaurant set up for Bento inside it and 
it, in my opinion, that was the best of both worlds coming together. Something that everyone could agree on was just for the best. And I love that that's the tie that it took to bring this family back together. Miwako dumps Rentaro, of course, mm -hmm. like instantly. And it's hinted that maybe they'll be able to get back together someday. But that's more than the other ending gives where Rentaro just gets like annihilated. Do you think he was genuinely sorry? Yes, definitely. Because his entire motivations all stem for his love of Miwako and how he wanted the two of them to be able to get away from this and live to in the city together. Yeah, that's fair. So in that regard, it's a happy ending for everyone but Rentaro and a happier ending if you pick the right choice. But... <laughs> In the end, this game had an absolutely just earth-shattering dramatic story with some crazy reveals, and I think that it should be lauded for that. So, I think it's time we enter the review category of the review. So, the way that we always do this is we don't like to rate Nancy Drew games with numbers out of 10, because some Nancy Drew games are better on paper than they are in practice. So we like to give our own grading scale for it, which is just A through F, A being good, F being terrible, and then the S tier above A for the best of the best. Who wants to go first? Yeah, I'll take it first. This game, I mean, at face value, the community just thinks spooky hard game. But I really wish that anyone listening to this re review, we could have convinced you that there is so much more offered in this game. It's got the best story, the characters at times can come off a little bland, but have some amazing motivations due to the story and just the tragic loss of the mom and the granddaughter, I mean, the, the mom and the daughter and everything, and it's just super compelling and it makes you want to keep learning more because ever since the beginning it's referenced that there's some grand secret being kept from nancy and that was just so intriguing to me the puzzles yes on the hard side and i always have contempt for nonograms but it's not like they're unsolvable i know they're solvable i've just never been able to understand them so that's on me the music is perfect it's broken down between traditional and techno and scary and it's just, everything is so distinct, so well done. And the atmosphere is great too. I love the garden areas. It's one of the most beautiful places in a Nancy Drew game. The Ryokan as a whole is awesome, and if I were in Japan, it's a place I would genuinely want to stay at, seriously. And the ending is awesome. I don't think there's ever been better storytelling than when we finally get the reveal from Takai, how shattered she sound, confessing it and everything, that Kasumi's death was ultimately her fault. Overall, this game's almost perfect. I have to give it an S. Another S tier game, 22 and 23. Okay, so I was expecting you to give it that. I know how much you love this game. I have a lot of problems with the puzzles in this game. They are ruthless and brutal. If you don't take on to these, how you solve nonograms or other puzzles, there was a while where we didn't even realize that renograms was the same thing from Trail of the Twister and that took us forever to understand. But otherwise, this game makes up for that in the amazing subplot of the cultural divide in Japan between the old and the new. And I think that alone as a subtext for the game was brilliant, let alone the heartbreaking and tragic story that they are able to put on in that setting. I'm going to give it an S2. I don't think a high of an S is Julian, but this game is severely underrated. It has an amazing story and setting and I would love to see it expanded someday in some other medium. This deserves a cinematic adaptation. <laughs> if you haven't played this game yet, please give it a shot. Search a spoiler for nonograms if you have to, because that's what we've done every single time we've played this game. And I do know that some people who haven't played the games like to rewind to the end of these reviews to see if we say they're any good. If you haven't played Shadow at the Water's Edge and you don't know anything about it, get it. It's worth your time. It's just amazing storytelling, but it's also, it strings on your heart, too. Sudoku is going to take up a lot of your time, but it is worth it. Mm -hmm. Well, that re concludes our review for Nancy Drew 23 Shadow at the Water's Edge. Just to let everybody know, we plan on reviewing Secrets Can Kill Remastered next. That's going to be interesting. So this is our third game now, where we have given a double S. This has now joined the ranks with Crystal Skull, Blue Moon Canyon, and itself, Shadow at the Water's Edge. Um, similarities in all three of these games? None that I can think of. I mean, Blue Moon Canyon and Crystal Skull have a quirky curio peddler, so maybe that's what made them shine. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, thanks for staying tuned, everybody. 
We hope you enjoy the rest of this series where we rank every single Nancy Drew game while we figure out how we're going to play Stay Tuned for Danger because we honestly have no idea. <laughs> All right, everybody, thanks for listening. Pick up the game if you haven't, and as always, vote for Holt. Vote for Holt, baby.